Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. We often do on Resurrection Sunday. I believe it's a great time for us to remember the power of the blood and the broken body of Christ. I think often enough we, well, sometimes we just take communion in church. And I really want us to think about it differently. In fact, when I was working on some stuff in Dad's office uh, upstairs, I found his communion set. And you can get these. I mean, you can get these online. You can get them fancy, plain, small, big. You can go with whatever you want. But I found this when it was given to him for Christmas in 1985. It was my senior year, if that tells you anything. And, and these are nice because you can have one of these in your home. It kind of makes it special more than you just grabbing a couple of glasses and, and a plate that you use every day. kind of sets it apart for your family. These are great to take into the hospital because communion is a reminder of the covenant and of, of the work that Jesus did through his body, through his broken body, through his blood. We'll talk about that tonight. I mean, it has the little glasses. It's got the thing that contains... Don't leave the grape juice in there. <laughs> you can get fresh. It's got the little thing for the bread. And so this is great for you to bring out when somebody in your family is sick or your friend is sick or maybe you need to come into unity as husband and wife or as a family in agreement on something. This is covenant stuff right here. And so I encourage you, if you don't have something like this, um, either just get you some little glasses. You can get them at the Dollar General. God don't, doesn't care. Set them apart. Make them special. I, I think we need to get, um, it needs to be a little less than ordinary. I mean, it doesn't need to be ordinary is what I'm trying to say. It needs to be something special. And so that we mark it in our minds. Not that the glasses have anything to do with it, but in our minds it makes a difference when we have something set apart. Right? So this month we've been studying a lot about being in him and identification with what he did every step literally every step of what he did uh, in his suffering was yours and we've got to identify with that suffering the scripture talks a lot about us identifying with this suffering and that's important because that was for my suffering and if we don't identify with the suffering then we don't identify with the resurrection life you have to identify with the suffering to identify with the resurrection life. April is going to do a teaching. I couldn't talk her into doing it tonight, but I think it worked out well. She's grinning back there. But April's been doing the Rick Renner study on the last week of Christ. She's going to teach it to you next Sunday night. Easter Sunday night. And things that we didn't know has to do with the history, things that we read over in the Scripture, but because we don't know the history of it, uh, we just read over it. And she's going to bring those things to light. And it will be an in-depth study Sunday night. So I want to encourage you. I'm not going to teach it because you're going to be excited to hear her teach it. She's been teaching it in Sunday school. So identifying is important. Identifying with every step, everything that he went through, you're supposed to see yourself in him, right? So nothing that we do, no ordinance that he's commanded us to do, which really was only baptism and communion, uh, nothing illustrates more tangibly what he did in his body than communion. Baptism kind of represents the life change. But nothing really represents more tangible, actually, what his body went through for you than communion. We've, we've got to get it out of the ordinary because it was certainly not ordinary. It's more than partaking of symbolic bread and wine. It's, I try to think of the words of what it means to intake what his body took. To, to receive what he did in his body. Accepting that willingly literally taking it into my body through communion. 
forcing my body and my mind to say, I accept what that broken body meant. I accept what that spilled blood meant. And I believe, totally believe, and the scripture indicates it as well, that it can bring a change in our physical body from the symbolic elements of what he did in his body and through his blood. It's powerful. You're talking about identifying with. Listen to what he says in John 6. I'll give you time to turn there. We're going to do quite a bit of reading tonight, mainly listening to Jesus' words himself. Talk about it. The things that he said here. Whew. John 6, I'm going to start reading in verse 30. I'm reading out of the NIV. It says, so they ask him, and you, you can read above, what miraculous sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? Now you want a sign. What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. This sounds better than manna to them. And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him. <laughs> They're good at that. Because he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. You know, I don't think they ever heard anything he said after that. I mean, they just shut their minds off. So they began to complain about it, and they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? They're associating him and his earthly relationship. They're not seeing him as being sent from God. And he said, Stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It's written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. So that's Jesus. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert. Yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh. Now, this, I sit in the office and just try to wrap my head around some of this because... This has got to be more than words to us. He said, this bread is my flesh. What I'm asking you to partake of is my flesh. The work that's going to be done in my flesh. I'm asking you to partake of this bread that is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now you've got to understand, these are Jewish boys here. And you don't eat flesh 
And I hope our young scholars understand that Jesus, Jesus is talking symbolically here of eating his flesh. He's not literally talking about eating his, his flesh or drinking his blood. It's symbolic of it, though. It's a partaking of it. And he said, they said, how can this, how can he give us his flesh? They're, they're, they're Jewish, so this partaking of blood, drinking blood, was forbidden by the law. And of course, eating his flesh would be forbidden by the law. They're like, how can this man tell us this? And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. If you do not receive for yourself to the point of partaking it for yourself, what is done in my flesh... And what was done through my blood, you don't have any life in you. This is the only way to it. Verse 54 says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. And I like this symbolically, because when we take communion and we choose to receive into our physical bodies the symbol of his flesh and his blood, it literally goes into our systems, our physical body systems. And Kaylee, you could get up here and preach this better than me as a a nurse. And all those letters you have after your name and that you're working on. She's, that means I'm smarter than Pastor Susan when it comes to this, is what those letters mean. Louise, you're a nurse. Several of you understand that when we, we put that bread and that juice to our lips, immediately cells start partaking, and then it goes into our blood system, through our digestive systems. Every cell, everything in our body is partaking of what Jesus did. That, no wonder it brings healing. What's well, just symbolic? We are choosing. We are choosing to accept those symbols into our body. I think that's a powerful thing. And I think we, need, we, we don't just need to pass the tray. I think we need to think about what we are choosing to put into our bodies when we do that. And I'm believing for my total health Sunday. <laughs> I, I, I'm believing for it now, but I'm believing manifestation is coming and I'm free from this mess. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as those particles of food remain in my body, go through my systems. It's symbolic of this. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me. I I don't know. That's powerful to me. That's continual. I'm not talking about taking communion continually. But who feeds on me. Of course, we feed on him through his word, through his presence. But communion is symbolic of that. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and they died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. It's what we live off of, him. It's what nourishes us, him. It's what gives us life, him. It's what gives us energy, him. It's what provides us healing, him. Everything is him. Verse 59, he said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. I haven't studied out why that's important, but I'm sure there's a reason that they told where he was. Verse 60 says, on hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? It's a good question for you and me. This is a hard teaching. It's We've got to wrap our heads around this. Who can accept this? Well, Sunday, when you take communion, 
You're saying, I accept this. I don't care if it is a hard thing. I don't, I don't care if I don't have my head completely wrapped around it yet. What I know is that when I choose to put this in my body, I am choosing to accept what he did for me. And then I, <laughs> verse 66 just amazes me. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And Jesus said, you don't want to leave too, do you? They, they couldn't. They couldn't get it. They, it. It was too much for them to accept. They didn't, of course, they didn't fully understand. But those that were true followers of him and true disciples of him came to a point where this was fixing to get deeper than just listening to him teach. It was fixing to get deeper than just reading the word. It was fixing to get deeper than just listening to somebody teach on a CD or whatever you download now. It was fixing to get deeper than that. It's fixing to come from a point of, of hearing it to partaking in it, to literally letting it become a part of every fiber of your being. That is the table of communion. I think we've been too shallow. I, I, I hope that we're gaining in our comprehension of it because it's so much more than bread squares and a cup of juice or a cup of wine. Jesus didn't make light at all of what he would ask us to do at the communion table because of what it says. It's a commitment. And it's more than some can swallow. The question comes up, wine or grape juice? I don't care. Okay, I don't care. I don't care. Uh, the scripture speaks of wine. Some people say, well, it's before it turns over. But then, you know, if you read the Passover, you, 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 I don't care. Wine or grape juice? It doesn't matter to me. I think the importance is that it's called the blood of the grape. The blood of of the grape. And if you want to go read, well, I'll read it to you, a passage about the blood of the grape that's symbolic here, you can go to Genesis 49, and it actually uses those words. If you think about where all this is taking place, there's a lot of grapes, okay? There's more grapes than there is clear water. <laughs> so, so wine was very important. And if you think about the making of wine, whether it had already turned over and fermented or not, it was crushed. That juice didn't come from extracting. It came from a crushing. And that is so symbolic of what Jesus went to, went through in spilling his blood. Genesis 49, verse 10. I just found this interesting. So this is Bible study night. We cover things that we don't normally cover. Verse 10 says, The scepter will not depart from Judah. This is all prophetic nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations is his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. And does that sound familiar to anybody in Jerusalem when Jesus came in? He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. That's just one example. I didn't write down any others. But I thought that might be a good place for you to start studying. The next question that people usually ask about communion is leavened or unleavened bread. Now, automatically, my mind said unleavened. But we're here to study, right? This got interesting. Passover used unleavened bread, right? Old Testament, Passover, you remember? Blood on the doorpost, we've been brought out of Egypt, we're waiting for the, the death angels coming through, the plagues. They used unleavened bread because leavening, which is simply yeast or a leavening agent, was a type of sin in the Old Testament. So we automatically think, oh, let's partake of unleavened bread. Well, I thought, okay, I'm going to look. I've never looked up the word bread in John 6 that we just read. My, my mind told me 
that it was probably unleavened bread. And when we go down and we read all the different other uh, things when Jesus is partaking of the bread, I just assumed that because it was at the feast of unleavened bread, that the bread that he took and broke was unleavened bread. Are y'all ready to be just intrigued a little bit just for the sake of study? Not starting a new doctrine. Just want us to, to learn to think and look. So the Greek word for bread in John 6 that we just read is artos, A-R-T-O-S, which means an ordinary loaf of bread. I thought, okay. So I Googled, said leavened bread or unleavened bread. And I found a little study, and it said the difference between two different words, artos, which is the one that we found in John 6. And then it compared it to a Greek word. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. A-Z-U-M-O-S. A-Z-U-M-O-S. And Marilyn, you can, you can check with Travis for us and see if he's got any good insight. Tell him to email me if he does. It means unleavened bread. This is interesting to me. So I got out my concordance on my computer. I brought, I brought old style out here because I didn't bring my computer out here. My computer program, I can go and I can put in the, the Strong's number for Artos, and as you most, and it'll show me every time that the loaf of bread is used, and it'll show me every time that the unleavened bread is used. Those specific words will show me each scripture in the New Testament that those are used in. And, and so I thought just for y'all, I would show you and the Strong's, what you do is you go to the front and you, they're in alphabetical order, and I looked up the word bread. And I know you can't see this because I've got it right here and I can't see it. <laughs> so Matthew starts right here. This is Old Testament bread words. Matthew starts right here, and from here all the way down to here, the word bread is only number 740, which is artos, loaf of bread. Only. I, I looked for number 106, the A-Z word. It's not even in here. And I'm like, but it said bread. Okay, we've got to remember we're translating here into the King James. And sometimes it's words like it, but not the exact word. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm going to look up unleavened. By the way, let me run over here to, that was number 740. You go to the back then and look at the number that's beside the word. Number 740 means bread, as raised, or a loaf. Bread, loaf. That's all the explanation it gives. So then I went to unleavened and looked up the word unleavened. Now from... Matthew, right here, to right here, New Testament, about half an inch, maybe an inch, is the number 106. Every time in here it says unleavened bread. Unleavened bread, unleavened bread, unleavened bread. It's uh, in Matthew 26, it's the day of the feast of unleavened bread. In Mark 14, it's the Passover and of unleavened bread. In verse 12, it's the first day of unleavened bread. In Luke 22, it's now the feast of unleavened bread. In verse 7 of that, it's uh, they came to the day of unleavened bread. In Acts 12, it's then there were the days of unleavened bread. In verse 20, it's Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. It's all about the feast. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5 was, you may be a new lump as you are unleavened, which I encourage you to study 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, if you want to study this leavened and unleavened bread, okay? Verse 8 says, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So none of it really, none of that unleavened bread thing really worked for me. 
just for the sake of teaching. Number 106 that it gave me to look at. It means unleavened. Unleavened means, or that word bread, unleavened. Simple as that. Uncorrupted. Uncorrupted, unleavened. These are great if you don't have one and you don't have a program on your computer. I still kind of remember how to do this, and some of us older ones will. We can help you. I might have to do a little refresher course, but uh, I can at least do that much. So this was interesting to me. Leavened bread for communion or unleavened bread for communion? Most of the words that Jesus speaks of bread in the Gospels is simply bread. Go to me to Luke 22. Inquiring minds want to know. That's why we do in-depth Bible study. And if you think about it, really Jesus was both. Without sin and then with our sin. That may be why he never sinned himself, but he was without sin, and then he took our sin, which I find it interesting. Luke 22, verse 13. Jumping in the middle here. And they went and found, as he had said, Jesus told them where to go, and they made ready for the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus is fixing to be crucified. This is the last supper. He took the cup and gave thanks. And said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it. He took the bread. He didn't label it. This is also artos. He took the bread, gave thanks, and he broke it. He broke it. This was not sliced bread. Okay, this wasn't little squares. In fact, I took communion back in the back while ago. I'll take it again with y'all. But before I put that little square in my mouth, I broke it. Because when I read this, it, that meant something to me. So if everybody in church Sunday sees y'all breaking your little squares, they're going to think, man, they can't handle it. <laughs> this means something to me. He took it and he broke it. Why? Because it was symbolic of what his body was going to go through and be broken for us. He gave thanks. He broke it. And he gave it to them. He broke his body and he gave it to you. To what? To partake of. See, we just read. No, we don't. We're studiers. He took the bread, he broke it, and he gave it to them. Saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Remembrance of me what? Oh, geez. Uh, remembrance of what he did, the breaking of his body, the spilling of his blood. Do this in remembrance of me. He's not just saying, remember who I was after I'm gone. Uh, you know, this is my legacy that you walked with me. No, this is important that you remember this moment that, that this body is broken for you. I'm giving it to you for you to partake of. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, also this cup after supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. It's the new covenant. In his blood. His blood is the only way into the new covenant, which is shed for me. That needs to be our answer. 
it was shed for me. So he ratified it in his blood. He ratified, he established the new covenant in and through his blood. And we continue to show our personal acceptance that that blood was for me. It was for me and I'm accepting it. I'm taking hold of everything that means. Everything that I find that that means, which is a lot because he said it was the New Testament, the New Covenant, that's pretty broad. That's anything that was under the curse, he reversed. That goes to Bridget, guys. Thank you. So in our taking of the elements of communion... My very flesh has to receive what I have chosen to take in. It has to because I choose it just as it has to take health because I choose his broken body. It has to line up with the new covenant and what it provides because I choose to take it into my body. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm getting lengthier than I thought. I've got pages to go here. I'll try to speed up. I just don't want us to just read. I want us to think about what we're reading. Oh my goodness, this one's so good. I've got this one in the message. Y'all may just have to look at me and listen to it and then read it in your version here in a minute because I really want you to hear what the message says here. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 15. He says, I'm, I assume I'm addressing believers now who are mature. And we've been talking about maturity on Sunday mornings, so I thought that was fitting. He said, draw your own conclusions. When we drink the cup of blessing, aren't we taking into ourselves the blood, the very life of Christ? So I, I'm assuming you're mature enough to handle what I'm fixing to say, but when you take this, aren't we taking into ourselves the the blood, the very life of Christ. Isn't that what we're taking in? Aren't we taking the very life of Christ? And isn't it the same with the loaf of bread? We break and eat. Don't we take into ourselves the body, the very life of Christ? And because there is one loaf, our manyness. Many, M-A-N-Y, manyness, becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in Him. Woo! Y'all mean, can I say that again? Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in Him. We, oh, this, mm. we don't reduce Christ to what we are when we take this. He raises us to what he is. This is why we read other translations. I'm sorry if you only believe in the King James Version, but it was not written in King James to start with. So make sure it lines up. Make sure your spirit agrees with it when you read another translation. But when it lights your fire like this, that's your spirit man going, that's a truth. And I love that. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in him because we've each partaken of him. It didn't fragment him when we each, when he broke the bread and gave this one a piece and that one a piece and that one a piece. It didn't fragment him. Rather, he is now in all of us and that makes us one, united. That's what we're going to do Sunday. It's going to be happening all over the world. It's not just RCC. It's his body. And we need to think about those things. We don't reduce Christ to what we are when we partake of him. But he raises us to what he is. When we take what he did in his body... And what he did through his blood into us, it doesn't change him. It changes us. It raises the standard inside of us. That's identifying with him through communion. That's beautiful to me. So we can't let it become ordinary. 1 Corinthians 11. Quickly. I may, I may start ahead of you. 
This is out of the NIV. Verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 11. He's instructing the church, uh, the apostles instructing the church, and he said, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. They had let it become ordinary, okay? And he's fixing to correct them. He said, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. You're, you're not going to all agree. Obviously, some people are going to walk in carnality. Some people are going to walk in the Spirit. We're all growing, right? He says, when you come together, verse 20, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. You've lost the vision here. You're not doing this as the Lord's Supper. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. That tells you they used wine. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And once again, that in remembrance of me, when I looked it up in the vines, it's not in memory of. This is exactly what Vine says. He said, this is not in memory of him, but in an affectionate calling of the person himself to mind, an awakening of the mind. Wake up, mind. You have partaken of the body of Christ. You have partaken of the blood of Christ. This is an awakening. I really like that. Verse 26, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim. That literally means you preach it. You declare it. The Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, which they were doing, will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. It's personal. It's his body. It's his blood. It was his suffering. This is personal. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. He asks us to examine ourselves because this, what are we taking into us? What are we saying we have accepted? And if we're saying we've accepted the broken body and the blood of Christ, then ought we to examine ourselves and make sure that we're living what we've partaken of. And when we find something in our examination, let it be corrected. You know he doesn't expect us to be perfect. But what he does do is expect us, when we think about the body and the blood, to examine ourselves. He knows we're a work in progress better than we know we're a work in progress. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And we don't often read these scriptures at communion, but I believe it's very important. He wants us to acknowledge and realize what we are partaking of. And he says, that is why many of you are weak and sick. He's not saying, he's not saying God struck sickness on them. He's saying, you haven't recognized my body what it did, you haven't recognized my blood and what it did, and a number of you have fallen asleep, died. <laughs> They've died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. We judge ourselves, and he judges us and brings things to our attention so that we will, we will change and not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. And if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I'll give you further instructions. He'll teach them more about it. What we serve at the, 
at the table of communion is not ordinary. It's not to be taken as ordinary. And you've got to remember, they had loaves of bread. Anybody else have a, a bread issue? Okay, so their, their temptation was to forget what this was about and to make it a party. And he's correcting them, and he's saying, you need to judge yourselves because this isn't ordinary. The Lord takes this very personal. In fact, it's so special that Jesus himself instructed us to continue in it till he returns. And that's why we still do it. From the, from the Last Supper forward, generation after generation, we have observed the Lord's body and his blood and partaken of it. I encourage you to do this at home. I encourage you to do this with your families. I know Bob and Charlotte do it every Christmas morning. They wrap the little communion set up, I believe. I think they do that. And they open it. It's the first thing that they open. Uh, I think they've got red glasses. They make it real special. But it's the first gift that they open every year. And they take communion as a family. Because it wasn't just about a, a baby in a manger. It was about the body and the blood. And, and it, traditions like that are powerful. And so I, I encourage us all... Uh, take it as a married couple when you need unity or um, as a family. If something's going on in the family, it's a great way to tie everybody together. Use it for health. Use it for anything that involves the covenant that you're, you're, you're lacking and you need help with your head. Take the covenant. Take the covenant. And I believe it will bring. It shut-ins. Oh, please, think about people who don't get to come to church anymore. They're probably never taking communion. They need that remembrance, the power of the covenant. So let's bring this back to life, not just something we do at Easter and Christmas. But he said, do it till I come. And I don't care if you do it every day as long as you keep it special. It's got to be more than ordinary. Amen. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.